Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 1, still a little bit, Tim, still just a little. So what I want to do is I want to, um, I don't want to preach long, okay, would that be all right? And then I want to have Anna and the team back up and I want to worship some more. Uh, and I feel like that'll be a, an emphasis of prayer there that I want to. I want to go. So I really just have one place, one central theme that I have this morning. And um, this is part two of the, the sermon series, The Mission. If I hadn't said that, I don't remember. Uh, Bob's got me flustered, this, this whole thing. So Genesis 1, and I want to go back over some of the things that we talked about in the first sermon because that was two weeks ago, and I have a strong feeling you don't remember <laughs> so let me give some highlights and then I'll jump into the, the, the theme of today and what I really want to focus on. The mission statement is the what, the vision statement is the how. I told you to write this down. God made us for a mission. God made us for a mission. So Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26, if you're there in your Bible, say amen. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. And we'll close with verse 29. Then God said, Look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your, fruit, for your food. So before these verses, God saw a need and said, I need a, represent, a representative of myself on earth. So he created man, a ruler for the planet. It's called dominion. Everybody say dominion. So ultimately, God is like, I created a perfect garden. I put every kind of tree, plant, etc., and I want you to continue to multiply it. Every good thing that is in the garden, I need you to take what's in this garden, and I need you to multiply it over the planet. So in that message, I asked you this question, why would God use the word subdue unless there was things that needed to be brought under control? So there's things on earth sometimes that we have to subdue. Everybody shout out subdue. So the garden was essentially the blueprint of what God wanted to reproduce in the earth. So the overall mission is number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, be fruitful. Number two, multiply yourself. And number three, govern your environment. Let me say those again. Be fruitful. Number two, multiply yourself. And number three, govern your environment. The same mission in Genesis all of those thousands of years ago is still the same mission today. Can I hear a big amen? In that message, we talked about David and the story of David and Goliath. Even people who are not Christians know that story. 4,000 years later, we're still talking about a boy who took authority over a giant. But let's look at David's backstory. His story didn't begin on the battlefield, even though that is what he is most known for. His story actually began on the backfield. And we talked all about the backfield experience. What happens on the backfield is more valuable in the kingdom than what happens on the battlefield when everyone is watching. Because really who you are is who you are on the backfield, not necessarily on the battlefield. Come on, somebody. The problem is we have an enemy that wants to get us engaged on the forefront. So you could say he's tempting us to get us out of our authority or on the edge of our authority before it's time instead of returning to the backfield where intimate relationships are formed, where worship songs are created, where the knowledge and nature of God is understood. We are called to the backfield. That's how we're prepared for the battlefield. Amen. So in Genesis, we get fruitfulness, multiplication, and leadership or dominion. 
If that is the case, and it is, then naturally our vision must be for three things. Number one, seeds. Number two, people. And number three, needs. Seeds, people, and needs. Everybody say that. Seeds, people, and needs. Our anointed mission gives us an appointed vision. Our anointed mission gives us an appointed vision. That means our focus should be on three things. Number one, resources. Number two, relationships. And number three, rulership. It's the resources around you. It's the relationships around you. And out of that comes leadership. See, we think mission comes from the outside in, and that's not true. And I've been saying this for years. Churches don't grow from the outside in. They grow from the inside out. Okay? We think somehow it has to happen from the outside in, but it's actually the opposite. We think we need motivation from the outside in. Read this book, hear this song, listen to this message, and all of those things are very important. But biblically, eternally, spiritually, and divinely, mission moves from the inside out, not the outside in. Because it's something that God gave you. Otherwise, you're a copycat. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You're just mimicking something you've already heard, a preacher you've heard, a song you've heard. But God wants to put mission in you, and it's birthed out of you and comes out of you. Come on, somebody. So it in you and then out of you, which is amazing enough. Isn't that what the Holy Spirit is? He lives in you, but then he comes out of you. What does Jesus say? Out of your belly shall flow living waters. Right? So it's from the inside out. Everybody say the inside out. Now say this, not the outside in. So it's resources, relationships, and rulership. Rulership is governance, and governance happens as a result of discipleship and stewardship, which involves mentorship and relationship. We should desire to be leaders, but not at the expense of relationships or fruitfulness of our inner circle. God said, lead the planet well, fruitfulness, multiplication, and order. God is a God of order. God always operates in order. He doesn't operate in chaos or confusion. In fact, we know the scripture. God is not the author of confusion, right? So God operates through order. He always operates through order. We should be, desire leadership, but again, not at the expense of the relationships or fruitfulness of the inner circle of our life. God said, lead the planet well. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. If you're faithful in little things... You'll be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be dishonest or honest with greater responsibility. Another translation says, who is faithful with small, I will make ruler over much. That is God's design. We shoot for the Goliaths of our generation, but we forget the intimate relationship with God that happens only on the backfield. Can I hear an amen? So with all of that in mind, I want to get to today's um, topic and the burden for today of what God has put on my heart. And it's not much, so if you'll just hang with me. It's not much. And really what this is, is my heart and where I've been and where I am currently, where God is doing something new in me, and I'm going to share that at the end. So with all of that in mind, seeds, people, and needs. Everybody say seeds people and needs. I have two questions for you. Where is the need and how do you lead? Where is the need and how do you lead? Here's the answer. You always lead to fix the need. You always lead to fix the need. How many of you know you don't have to have a title to meet a need? And spoiler alert, the needs around us are the mission. The needs all around us are the mission that God has put us on. Let's go back to David for a moment. So in that first message, we praised David and we talked about David and his intimate relationship with God and what a wonderful man he was and he was and we know that he was a man after God's own heart and we don't, we don't take away from that at all or negate that. David was a man after God's own heart. But before we get too carried away of David's intimate relationship on the backfield, 
I need to warn you about David a little bit. And I need to give you a warning. David, from the time that he saw Goliath, his focus shifted from the backfield to the battlefield. And his focus after Goliath was defending Israel on the battlefield. But here's the warning. David's focus shifted from the backfield to the battlefield, and when he did, he neglected his dynasty or his legacy. He had a defensive posture. He never returned to the backfield I mean, we, that we know of, you know, per se, biblically. He stayed in a battlefield mindset. Now, he did get bored with the battlefield, and we know what happened with the whole Bathsheba debacle and the affair and, and having her husband murdered, and we know all about that. And what happened with that, it caused a lot of dysfunction. And what I want to say to you is this. Sin affects you. Sin has tremendous consequences, and it affects us deeply. But where sin really affects us is the the next generation. It's the seeds that come after us. So it's our dysfunction that leads to our children's dysfunction. Anybody following me? So we think, well, it's just hurting me. It's not hurting anyone else. Well, actually, you're wrong. It's actually affecting the next generation. So it was dysfunction. David was a worshiper in the backfield where he wrote half the Psalms in your Bible from the backfield, but he missed it when it came to mentoring his own children. Whatever God's mission was for his life, which one of those was the battlefield, it still didn't exempt him from his own household. God wanted his children to be a part of the multiplication of David's house on the backfield. David could have gathered his family and said, I've been on the battlefield a long time. I'm a man with blood on my hands. But family, I've got to take you back to the backfield with me. But we see no sign of David necessarily taking his children to the backfield. Our greatest calling is not just to take down the enemies of our generation, although that's an important part of it. Our greatest calling, church, is to equip the next generation. Come on, give the Lord a hand. Our greatest calling, our greatest mission is to equip the next generation. And I don't know about you, and I'm going to talk about my story, but I'm not going to miss it. I'm not going to miss the appointment that God has put on us to equip the next generation. I'm going to elevate them, and I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to go ahead and go get ahead in my message. Is that okay? I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. This church is going to be committed to reaching the next generation. This church is going to commit ourselves to reaching the next generation. Whatever the cost, whatever we have to do, we're not going to to neglect that next generation. Can I hear a big amen? He could have made sure they were worshipers, but he didn't. And because of that, he complicated Israel's history. Now, we know not entirely. God still used what the devil meant for evil. But let's say it was complicated at best. I don't want to miss the greater mission because I'm always looking to take down a Goliath. The greatest mission of multiplication is the seed of the children that God gave us. Remember, it's seeds, people, and needs. And the mission is all around us. They run around your home. They use your water and electricity. They eat your groceries. That is your mission. They're called your children. Amen. You know, there was a time in our our country's history, and, and this is not a sexist remark, this is a biblical remark, where there was a focus on the family. There was emphasis on the family. That I didn't get my identity from my job or my title. And ladies actually stayed home and and the family unit was, was productive and it was the biblical model where mom focused on the kids and, and there was, um, uh, importance and, and onus and emphasis placed on that title. We need to get back to that. 
where the children know that I'm important and my whole job, my whole makeup is to make sure the seeds of the next generation continue and they continue positively. Come on, church. I'm feeling something in here. We've got to do that. Can I hear a big amen? I believe that is the most successful model there is. Why? It's God's model. It's the biblical model. I believe that is the definition of success, and I get that from Genesis chapter 1. I would say it is the very definition of success. See, here's what you need to know. God, and God gave me this the other day, and I just, I just wanted to run around, and my dogs are running around. I think my dogs are full of the Holy Ghost. I'm pretty sure they are. Man, I was having a good time. They were having, I, I preached it to them. They love every message I preach. This was powerful. God doesn't see chronological time. We do. He sees through time. Get this. So when you stand before him, he will see you through the fruitfulness and multiplication through generations that come after you because of you. He sees through. God can see the beginning to the end. He's seeing what's coming after you. Come on, somebody. Come on, that's a golf hand clap. Come on, y'all can do better than that. So we measure success by whether or not we wrote a book or we had a hit song or we get rich or we have a successful business or a successful career and we climb the corporate ladder or we win a championship. Yet God says, where are you being fruitful? Where are you multiplying yourself? How are you governing? In other words, how are you leading your family? How are you leading the environment around you? Did you take the seed that I gave you and did you duplicate it in the earth with my nature, my name? In other words, have you multiplied me? Have you multiplied me in the earth? See, we have a craving of a Goliath or we're nothing. But I want to remind you today, Goliath was one single moment in David's life. One single moment. Don't live your life for a giant. Live your life for the heart of God's will. Amen and amen and amen. (laughs) Pastor D, if you would come and play, I'll have the worship team come up in just a moment. What is God's will, Pastor? Pastor? Three things. Here it is. The seeds that he gives us. And number two, the people he sends us. And number three, the needs around us. So it's the seeds he gives us, number one. Number two, the people he sends us. And number three, the needs around us. So let me tell you a little bit about Pastor Jay and where I'm at. It's Pastor D. Play something softly. This whole thing with this next generation has just got me. I, I, don't, I don't know. You know, just asking the Lord for vision for this house and where we're going. And really and truly, it, it, it really didn't start with a church because I was seeking God for my family. And there was just such a burden that God gave me for the next generation. And I know that'll be carried out here and we're going to see that here. But here's really where I was. I, um, I'll be 50 my next birthday. And I know that that's not old, and I don't think that's old, but I do know that I'm on the back half of my life. And I'm good with that, by the way. I'm really good with that. But I began to think about our kids, Alicia, all four of them, and we've talked about this in great length. And now we got a grandbaby. He's awesome, by the way. You ever seen a picture? I can show you one. <laughs> and they're talking about more grandbabies. Praise God. But I was thinking about that, and, and it's just, for the last really two years, it's just, um, it's really been on me, even before Harlan was born. And I was talking to one of my mentors the other day, and I've talked with him about this at great length, and I said, I don't know what's going on with me, man. I'm wonky. I'm weird. He was laughing. He said, why are you wonky? (laughs) 
And I said, man, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I'm emotional all the time. And I just started telling him about this, this passion I have for the next generation. And I, and I was telling him, and of course, he's heard a lot of this before, so this was nothing new to him. But I was telling him, you know, about our kids and grandkids and all of that. And I was like, I don't want to miss them. I don't want to miss their life. Because I'm, I'll be honest, I missed a lot of the first part of their life because I was stupid. And I was chasing the wrong things. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I said, God, I don't want to miss them. I don't want to miss their lives. I don't want to miss the celebrations. I don't want to miss Harlan. I don't want to miss one moment of significance. I want to be there. I want to be there. And my mentor told me, this and it hit me like a ton of bricks he said Jason you know what's wrong what's going on and what's happening with you and I said no I wish you'd please tell me because I think I'm going crazy (laughs) and he said son your life is shifting and he said you're no longer chasing success he said you've tasted success and you've achieved success, and you've been successful in your giftings and callings and the things that you do. You've you've seen success. You know what success is, and you've been successful. But he said, you're moving into your life where you're no longer chasing success. You're chasing significance. And I said, that's it. That's it right there. I could care less about being successful. I did, I chased that dream all my life and I got here and I'm like, is that all there is? Is this it? Because I don't know if I like this. And now I don't want success and accolades. Now I want significance, which means I want to impact the next generation. I want to impact the next generation. I want to take them to heaven with me. I want to see them in heaven. I want to go after them. And so what you're going to see, and I don't know what this looks like, and we're still trying to figure out what does this even look like. And I don't know, but I know this. I'm not going to miss my babies. I'm not going to miss them. And I love this church, and and I'll tell you this, God comes first, but my family comes second. And I love you guys, but my family's going to hit second every time. And I don't know how this looks or what this looks like in our future, but I know this. I'm still still like you trying to figure it out, and I'm praying, God, what does this model look like? But I can tell you this. I'm going to spend as much time with my kids and my grandkids as I possibly can. That doesn't mean I'm not going to be here for you. I'm going to be here for you too, but I'm going to make sure that I'm spending time with them. So I need you to do me a favor. When I'm not here, I need you to worship and be just as engaged as when I'm here. Amen? Come on, somebody. It doesn't matter who's preaching. Come on. It doesn't matter who's here. If we're here and we're not, Jesus is here, and we come for him, not for Alicia and I anyway. Amen? So we're fixing to make room and time. In fact, I'm leaving this week. I'm going to see my grandbaby. I'm going to Memphis, Tennessee with him. Why? Because I'm going to prioritize that. And I'm not going to get to the end of my life and have regrets. Come on, somebody. I want to know these kids are a priority, and I want them to know. I want these two little girls right here to know you're a priority to One Community Church. You're a priority to Pastor Jay. We're going to give you everything we got. We're going to make investments into your future. And we're going to make sure this is a church of the next generation. Saddest thing in the world is to walk into a church and the youngest person there is 50. God forbid. God forbid. We are raising up a new generation. Guys, we're not going to be here forever. I don't want to be here forever. I want to make sure we're equipping the next generation the best we possibly can. Is anybody on board with Pastor this morning? Come on, are we on board for the next generation? Come on, if you are, stand to your feet, worship team, if you would come. I want to say this too. Um, I was in men's group the other day or the night in the community brothers and they were talking about pastors and stuff. And I said this to them. I said, if I'm never not here, 
and you're looking for a pastor, look for these qualities. And one of the things I said, it just came out of my mouth. I was like, what in the world does that mean? <laughs> I mean, I know what it means, but it was just like I couldn't believe I said it. It was like, whoa, that was powerful. I said, um, I was telling them, I said, find a pastor that won't always do what's best for him. Find a pastor that will do what's best for this church. Amen? Because it's the same as parenting. A parent doesn't always do what's best for them. They do what's best for their children. Okay? I make a lot of decisions here that don't benefit me at all. At all. In fact, it actually <laughs> does the opposite. It actually makes more work on me. I could have just said no and we did this, but I don't because I know it's what's best for this congregation. And so as parents, we do what's best for our kids. It's the same thing. I think about my dad and my mom. Oh, I love you, mom. I love you. Wow, come on, give her a hand. Come on. Real quick story and we're gonna worship. So my dad's dream was to be full-time in ministry and he never got to, but I did. Because he didn't do what was best for him. He did what was best for me. My dad had the opportunity to um, take a large church, a, a, a church already pl uh, you know, planted and been there for years, and it was a, an amazing church. He didn't have to build anything, didn't have to plant anything, didn't have to plow. And do all. It was all there. It was all there for the taking. And so he went there to preach and view of a call, and he, he goes there to possibly be their new pastor. And I was a boy. I remember going with him. And uh, everybody was like, Eddie, you're crazy if you don't do this. This is it. And Dad said, before I give you an answer, let me go home. Let my wife and I go home and fast and pray. And they did. And at the end of that prayer time, they came back and said no. If my mom and dad hadn't have said no to that amazing offer, I wouldn't be standing right here right now. My mom and dad instead said the Lord called us to plant a church. Now that was back in the late 80s, early 90s. That church planting wasn't cool and hip then. People, it was unheard of. The denominational minded churches were the churches of the day. Non-denominational churches now are big, but they weren't then. And so dad started a church out of nothing with just a few people, which was our family. And had he not done that, if they had not done that, I would not be standing here. Why? Because he didn't do what was best for him or them. He did what was best for me. Amen. So I end like this. One of my missions and calls in this season for One Community Church is to go to the roots of the things that need to be addressed in our generation. And I think one of the greatest things that we can do to our, for our generation is preach the Word of God to tell them the truth without compromise, to call out the elephants in the room and preach the gospel. Can I hear an amen? The fruit, this is good, grab a hold of it. The fruit is a reflection of the root. And if the root is bad, the fruit will be bad. And the anointing on this church is to go deep because of the next generation. We're not called to manage things, we're called to lead things. Our mission is making disciples, but listen to me, you first have to be a disciple before you can make a disciple. Amen. I didn't say saved and, and repeat the Lord's Prayer. I said you have to be discipled in order to disciple well or the fruit will be bad. Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you for this word that you've given us. God, I pray that it would go deep. And I'll be honest, Lord, I don't understand everything that you're telling me. This is spiritual. So much of what I said today is spiritual, and I don't understand all of it in fruition. To fruition. But, Lord, I do understand that you told me to do it, so I did it in obedience. And, God, I thank you that, as the Word says, one plants and one waters, but it's you that gives the increase. So, God, I pray that today 
you would get the increase of whatever this is we're talking about the next generation but you're birthing something in our heart and I, I say this all the time spiritually it happens first and then physically we see the manifestation of it so I believe today I cast vision and Lord I believe we're going to see the fruition of this very very soon and God I thank you that we're going to be people that are not focused on success but significance and preparing the next generation, not selfish, not what's in it for me, but what can I do to equip this next generation? Father, I thank you that we're going to be those people, and we thank you for it right now. And all God's people said amen.